So my name is Mathieu Miguet, and I'm the co-founder of a collective of musicians called Les Chemins de Traverse. And we played on a great variety of instruments from Baroque Traverso to 21st century Harpeggi, and from a, a Renaissance repertoire. to free improvisation. Okay, the, the slot just after meal is a very dangerous slot because uh, it's siesta time, so I'm making some noise to, uh, to keep you awake. Um, one of our areas of research is augmented instruments, in the sense that we try to extend the possibilities of traditional music instruments using new technologies and computers. Of course, the possibilities are countless, so we choose guidelines in order not to get lost. The first one is music first. We want to avoid doing something because it is technically possible. Oh, that's cool, we are going to do this. We try to always start from a musical idea. Uh, well, I think I want to, to do this thing and then see how and if it can be done. The second one is an augmented instrument is a musical instrument. So it must be from a player point of view, it must be controllable. We don't want, you know, random, random effects coming or something like that. Uh, and we must be able to adapt what we play to, to the audience, to the room, etc. So we don't want pre-recorded sounds, preset tempos. We want to be able to play everything live on stage. Another credo is history matters. Centuries of history have brought music to what it is now. And we don't pretend to found a wholly new music, you know, or whatever that means. We just build upon the existing and try to add perhaps a little bit of vernish here and there. And the last point is durability and independence. Actually, we would hate that years of research and experimentation disappear just because a software vendor discontinues a project. That's why we only use U.S.'s software and programming languages published under free license. So that might sound a little bit abstract. So here is a song from Augmented Bass Flute, so you hear how it sounds. So it's based on a Renaissance song with a small twist.
<coughs> Thank you. So, like I, like I, I told you, nothing is pre-recorded. Everything is played on stage and then looped or stored for later use or things like that. And in order to explore this this um, kind of uh, music making, we need a quick way to build prototypes of real-time ultra-low latency audio systems. Uh, what's the thing about latency? So the audio latency of a system basically is the time it needs for the sound to go into the system, have whatever treatment it must have, and come out again. And if this time is very long, say it's one second, so the musician, uh, say and the violinist, comes, plays something, and it sounds one second later, it's much, much, much too long, it's not possible. Uh, actually, to be able to play things a little bit quickly with percussive effects and everything, we want the audio latency to be lower than 10 milliseconds, so it's quite short. And when I say 10 milliseconds, it's including the latency introduced by the sound card, so you have very few milliseconds left uh, for, for the computer um, treatment. So quickly building prototypes should sound good to a Python developer, but the real-time low latency part might sound a little bit problematic. Uh, so maybe I should just go over and this is perhaps it is not a Python talk. Um, what are the possible solutions? Now, as a disclaimer, I will be very unfair to many great projects. Uh, I should present them more fully, but, well, I don't have that much time, so excuse me if, if I'm a little bit unfair. The first possibility would be using existing software. It's an obvious possibility. Uh, as a reminder, we only use free software, but there are very, really great free software like GuitarX or Superlooper, and they make certain things very easy, and if they allow you to do what you need, there, there's absolutely no reason not to use them. But if they do not, uh, and there are some things in the video you just saw uh, that uh, I could not do with these tools, so you have to look for something else. Uh, another quite obvious solution would be writing real-time C or C++ code. So this is just an excerpt of the code needed to write an audio through program. So just take the audio in and put it out without any treatment in C using the Jack audio uh, server. The whole code is more than 120 lines, and basically you do nothing. Okay, uh, this is much too verbose. Uh, as a musician, I don't have the time to write this, and as a musician. I really don't want to think about, you know, pointers and, uh, and uh, memory management and things like that. I want to, to think about sound and uh, what happens to my sound. Uh, so this is not a reasonable solution. Although somebody has to do it, of course. Another solution would be visual programming environments uh, like Pure Data. Pure Data is a great environment when you have boxes representing treatments, and then you just have to connect the boxes. So you have a box representing audio in, you have a box representing audio out, you just connect them, and you have your audio through. So that's much, much, much better than the, the C example. Uh, the problem with pure data is that in real life it tends to get quite messy, and if you are not very careful, you are likely to end up with something like this. I told you I was going to be unfair, but still. Also, pure data doesn't work so well with version control systems, and I like to have my, uh, my audio patches uh, under version control, so I know what I change, and if it doesn't sound like yesterday, I can, uh, I can look and, oh, okay, I, I changed that, perhaps it wasn't uh, such a good idea. So another solution would be to use domain specific programming languages. There are many great audio programming languages like Chuck or Faust or Superclider, C Sound, you name it. Um, for instance, the video, the long video you saw before was based on a Chuck program uh, because it was made two years ago and I uh, didn't know the module that allowed me to do this in Python. Now I would do this with Python, but. Um, 
some of these programs are very mature, some are quite experimental, and sometimes you have some interesting things happening. Um, but the main problem for us, ironically, is that they are domain-specific languages. And if we want to access uh, some, some kind of peripheral, uh, or write some kind of file, uh, read-write files, and things like that, it might be very difficult or even impossible, depending on the language. So uh, it's a little bit uh, sad to, uh, to have a great idea, you code half of it, and then you say, oh, that's simply not possible to do it. So what would be a really great solution? It would be to have a generic programming language, and my language of choice, and probably many, many of you would agree, is Python, with a library for real-time audio processing. And actually, for Python, it does exist. It's called Pyo. It was written by, it, it is being written by uh, Olivier Bélanger in Montréal. And this is how you would code the audio through example in Pyo. I will come to the details a little bit later, but uh, it's much better than the C example, a little bit more verbose than the uh, domain-specific languages. But on a properly configured computer, this is all you need to have a very low latency audio treatment. And for us, a uh, properly configured computer is a Linux box. Remember, we want to work only with free software. So a Linux box with a patched kernel. There are patch, patches for real-time operation. Uh, and the Jack Damon running. And what is uh, low latency for us? Anyway, it's uh, a latency smaller than 10 milliseconds. Uh, we usually we can get to four milliseconds of inner, if you want, inner uh, latency. So the um, the latency in the computer. Then you add the um, the sound card, and you get to to let's say five, six milliseconds. So that's very reasonable. Uh, it's about the same thing as dedicated hardware. I'd been aware of the Pio modules for some time, but I never used it really in a, in a gig. And last year I was preparing a solo concert with several pieces for augmented flutes, and I thought, well, that's a great opportunity to put Pio to the test and see if it really works. Um, by the way, the concert was called Monopoly because uh, with a monodic instrument, uh, I'm playing the flute, so it's a monodic instrument, I wanted to try always to uh, create polyphonic music. So mono, monodic, polyphonic, monopoly, okay. Um, the remaining of the talk will present some of the pieces I wrote for the occasion and how I, do, uh, how I did this. In the first piece of the gig, I wanted to have my contrabass flute sound like an alp horn playing in the mountains. So I needed to recreate the sonic characteristic uh, of, the, of the mountains. Um, so, how can I do that? First, some boilerplate code, so import Pio, obviously. Um, in the Pio documentation, you will often find from Pio import star, but I don't like import star, so I import Pio. And then I create a server. The idea of Pio is having what's called a server, so uh, a process written in C that handles all the low-level detail. Uh, so you create a server, and then you forget about real-time, about uh, everything. You can just create objects that will live in this server, and you get handles to, to do things with these objects. It's quite like a puppet theater, you know, you just pull threads, and they move uh, under, under this, but you don't have really to think about the details. For instance, my contrabass flute isn't very loud, so I want it to be amplified. And to do this, I create an input object, which obviously takes the input from, uh, from my sound card or from my audio server. And I can call the out method on this input. And so the, everything that comes in will go out. And I store this input object in a variable because I will need it later. 
So now my flute is amplified, but it doesn't sound at all like a flute in the mountains. So I will uh, add a reverb object, it's called free verb, and it's also very easy. I create a reverb object, and the first argument uh, is the input of the reverb. So here I take my input object i. Then I have the parameters of my reverb, and I send the output of this object to the out. Doesn't sound like uh, playing the mountains. It sounds rather like playing in a, in a room. So I'm not there yet. Uh, what's characteristics um, uh, about playing in the, um, in the mountains? Uh, in the mountains, if you play something loud, like an alphorn, uh, you get, you know, cliffs and rocks and everything, sending the audio back to you at different intervals. Basically, this is uh, what's called a delay. So, I want to add a delay. One great thing about Pio is that if you replace a parameter of, uh, of an effect uh, or of a Pio object by a list, you get for free a set of objects that will do uh, the same thing. So here I wanted several delays of 1 second, 1.y and 1.2 seconds, and I just create a delay object with a list uh, for the delay parameter, and for free I have three delays, but I can use them as, as if they are one object. And I don't send this delay uh, directly to the out because it would be much too dry uh, and it would sound rather like a, a, a nearby wall than uh, a cliff. So I send these delays, these three delays, to another reverb object and I send this to the out. So if you think about it, this is already a rather convoluted treatment with two reverbs, three delays, and uh, some, some complex wiring between them. And um, actually, it's quite, uh, you, you see quite quickly what's happening. Basically, you have uh, these uh, three, four lines uh, that do things. After that, I call the GUI uh, method on the server to have a GUI appearing. Uh, you don't need a GUI, you can go headless if you want. Uh, the only thing is that you have to keep your Python uh, process alive. So maybe uh, you, you, you can just uh, have uh, input, x <laughs> equals input, and uh, it could uh, work. Uh, and it will kit when you hit enter or anything that will keep your process alive. So, how does it sound like? <laughs> Okay, so this is uh, quite new for us to use Pio for a concert, so we don't have uh, videos yet. Uh, that's why you have still pictures and some sound. Another thing I wanted to try, I've been uh, thinking uh, about it for quite, uh, quite some time, was playing canons with myself. A canon basically is the same melody shifted in time. So uh, it's, uh, it should not be that difficult. Uh, main, basically, you have to add a delay and it should work. The only problem is that I didn't want to have a fixed delay because uh, I don't know exactly how fast I'm going to play. So I can just say, well, I want a delay of uh, 1.3 to 5 seconds and it will work. I want to be able to choose, well, uh, today I, I'm feeling... Uh, uh, I'm feeling uh, fit, I, I want to play very fast, or, well, I'm not that sure I will play slowly. Um, and actually, that's quite easy to do. First, I need my input object to get the audio input. Uh, in this piece, I didn't want to amplify the, uh, my flute, so, uh, because I was playing in a small room, uh, so I don't send it to the output. And then, I thought, what would be a nice way to, to have a variable delay? Uh, and I thought, well, I could simply, when I start my Canon, press on my foot controller with my foot, because my hands are on my flute. 
so I press with my foot on the foot controller, and when I want the second uh, part to start, I press again, and uh, that's it. And actually, I was quite amazed to see that I can write it like that. So here I'm using another project that I wrote also with Bio to access uh, my food controller. It's a soft food controller, uh, and I needed to access it. So basically, um, I'm, I'm building what's called a trigger. A trigger in Pio is um, basically a, a way to uh, to mark a time in. A, it's a kind of bookmark in time. You know, uh, it's a, a certain moment like that. Uh, and then I create a timer object, which will uh, calculate the time between uh, my uh, two successive B1 triggers, so two successive presses of my uh, foot controller. And another great thing of Pio is that you can replace a parameter uh, where normally, normally you should put a um, uh, number. Uh, my delay should be, uh, I don't know, one second or something like that. And I can put another Pio object, and this will feed the the object with the value the current value of the uh, of the object and parameter so this is you add the boilerplate code so you create the create a server you you create the gui and that's all you need to play canons with yourself That's it. So I'm not quite sure what Telemann would have thought of that, but uh, anyway, he's not here to to uh, say anything, though. In another piece, I wanted to have some kind of oriental feeling. And as a part of this oriental feeling, I wanted to have a complex polyrhythm playing. And the normal way to do it uh, with loops would be to record a first uh, percussive sound layer, and then record the second layer and the third one, and uh, uh, it takes some time. And for the audience, it's not that interesting because you have the strong feeling that the piece hasn't started yet, and uh, that uh, the the guy is only uh, preparing things, and that's not really interesting. So I wanted to have something much more. Uh, much more efficient, and my idea was I could record one loop, and if I play an interesting rhythm in my first loop, uh, namely uh, an odd rhythm, um, I can play this loop at full speed, at half speed, at quarter speed, and I will get a complex polyrhythm, which takes uh, a very little time to, to build. And this is very easy to do. First, I have to create what's called a, a table, a new table, uh, which is basically uh, an array optimized for um, storing audio data. And then two objects, a table rec object, which is meant to record audio in the table rec. And here, uh, uh, with, with input, I, I must give what is the input of the uh, uh, I want to record, and where do I want to store it? And a looper object. And this looper would be a player of my audio that will automatically loop. And here, the interesting part is the pitch equals here. I simply say uh, I want to play it at full speed. This is the one at half speed and quarter speed. and. I don't need much more to, to have this uh, polyrhythm playing. Then, when I want to record um, something, I just have to call the play object on my uh, record table rec object. Um, when I want to stop recording, I call stop. And when I want to play my loop, I call out. So that's really quite easy. 
Another thing, uh, uh, you will hear a little bit later uh, how it sounds. Another thing I wanted to, to have was a kind of drone, you know, uh, something like like you, you get in Indian music, for instance. Uh, so I thought I can use my voice like I did it and I record a small loop and I loop it, but it doesn't work doesn't work because uh, at the end of the loop you always have a click and the effect is not at all the, the one that I want. But when you create a looper object you have um, a so-called crossfade um, argument and the idea of crossfading is for instance if you give a value of 50% for crossfading you read the first half of your, of your loop and when you get to 50%, you begin to crossfade the end of the loop with the beginning of the same loop, okay? And when you get to the point when uh, the, the second track is at full volume, the, the, uh, the first one is at zero, and then you cross again. And so you have this, uh, this impression of something going, uh, going on and on and on. And to get an even more interesting impression, uh, I choose to have two crossfading values, so one to uh, fifty percent, another one to forty-three. Don't oh, I should put forty-two? I think. <laughs> Never thought of it before. Um, I guess I wasn't in geek mode when I wrote this. Uh, and um, then you you get the the, the voice drone. There's a problem I just uh, put away uh, uh, until now, is I just told you when, when I want to record my loop, I just have to call the method, uh, uh, play, uh, etc. But of course, I don't really want to uh, uh, put my flute down and uh, go write the, write the code. This is called live coding, and uh, that's not what I'm doing. Um, once again, I want to be able to, to do it uh, with, my, uh, with my feet or, or anything, uh, but uh, um, my idea was uh, having a, a generic solution, which would be to have some kind of state machine and say, well, my piece will be a first state uh, where this is happening, happening I have uh, this kind of treatment, and then when something happens, I want to go in a second, uh, second uh, state, etc. And I wanted this to be quite easy to write, so I decided to use, um, uh, to, to have my states as functions, so that's really convenient to, to write. One problem I had is that if I have the PIO objects as local variables of my functions, uh, the local variables are, uh, disappear when I have finished executing my functions and the treatment uh, is over. So uh, I, I must have some kind of global store when I put the, the objects I want to, to, to keep. Um, and then I have a state machine. I don't show you the, the code of the state machine because it's... Uh, I, uh, there are some PIO things that I should explain, and I'm, uh, I would be a little bit late, I think. So um, the, the idea is I create a state machine, then I say, well, in my first state, I want to do this, this, this. Uh, and then I tell to my state machine, your transitions will be that. For instance, here, if I press uh, my food controller button one, you will go to uh, the, the, the second state. And in the second state, I say, okay, I uh, record the percussion, for instance, okay? Um, well, I think first some sound and then some more remarks. So the percuss percussive sounds, part of which are recorded for later use. Here you hear the sound taking over.
Okay. So the, um, at the end, you hear these three layers of, uh, of percussive sound. The bass drum is simply the, the same as the high sound, but playing uh, at quarter speed. And I, I get this uh, quite interesting sound. Um, an interesting thing is that the whole code for, um, for this piece is about 90 lines of code. That's about three quarters of my first example of playing audio through with C. So uh, it's uh, it's a much more uh, much more way a much more produ productive way of uh, experimenting with uh, those things. The last piece I will talk about uh, today uh, is a much more uh, a funky piece, and I wanted to have a, a wah effect on my on my bass flute. Um, well, if you play the guitar, the bass guitar, you should know what a wah effect is. For the other ones, it's, you know, uh, when a guitarist plays and it makes wah, 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 this kind of thing, okay? Um, from an audio perspective, um, a wah effect is basically a bandpass filter uh, that will boost some, some part of the audio spectrum. And uh, the center frequency of this uh, bandpass filter uh, just swipes up and down. And it makes wow. Basically, that's the idea. And how do you uh, make this center frequency swipe? Uh, one way is using, um, using a, an expression pedal wow, with, with your foot. But if you want it to be very fast, it's not easy to really... Well, uh, it's more like uh, going cycling that, uh, than uh, playing music. Um, uh, another way that's quite popular with guitar is using the, um, the sound of the guitar uh, to modify itself, it's called auto wah, and basically you uh, you uh, use the loudness of the sound to steer the the center frequency. If the sound is loud, uh, you emphasize the um, the higher spectrum, and if the sound is quiet, you emphasize uh, the lower part. Uh, and it works very well with guitar because guitar has a strong attack and then uh, a decay. So it works very well. Wah, 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 wah. But the flute doesn't have that. So I wanted to have a, a new kind of, uh, of wah effect. I, I, I'm not sure if it exists anywhere else. Maybe, but I never heard of this. Uh, I wanted to have one track of sound that would have the wah effect and the second track of sound that would steer the wah effect uh, with its loudness. And this is the, the code for it. So first I need my input. Here I have two channels, so, so I must uh, say I, I have my, my bass line on channel one and uh, my control uh, line on channel two. And then I build a follower object. Basically that's an object that will uh, look if the sound is uh, loud or quiet, okay? and. Uh, I, I have just to, to scale the output so that it's in, in, the, in the right part of the spectrum. And then I create uh, a bandpass filter. It's a, a particular, ca particular case of a B quad filter. Um, and I take the bass as, uh, as input. And the frequency, the center frequency of this uh, filter is my follower object. And then I have my, my new, uh, brand new, uh, wah effect. And then I thought, I know what I want to do with this, um, with this piece, and it uh, implies uh, using quite, quite many loops with quite um, subtle um, uh, synchronization and everything. And actually, Pio has everything to do it, but uh, the gig was uh, like uh, in one week. And um, I thought, well, I have something that does it very well. It's called Super Looper. Uh, and I thought, well, I could just uh, use Super Looper for loops and lo uh, use Pio for everything else and have both of them communicate through OSC. I don't know uh, if you know OSC. It's kind of, uh, kind of MIDI, but better, <laughs> basically. Um, and so I can... Um, 
it's quite easy. I can say uh, if I get um, if I get on this port, I get a message with address loop state. I will call the function loop state, and then I register. I say to Superlooper, well, I want well. There are some things that are not that nice, but basically, I said uh, whenever the state of the loop number zero changes, please send me a message, and then I get the message. And so I can have both communicating. I have the sound coming into Superlooper. Then I have my loops, several tracks that go out to Pio. And Pio make everything like effects and uh, things like that. And I also have a state machine because I want to do some complicated things. So the state machine will um, get input from Superlooper saying, oh, I'm, I'm beginning uh, uh, loop uh, number zero again. And uh, Pio will say, oh, OK, so shut up for a little while. And uh, I will tell you when you, you must uh, uh, go make sound again. Basically, that's the idea. So this is the beginning of a piece, for some reason, called Snaking Ground. <laughs> This is the sound all, uh, without Y effect. Now we have the Y effect coming. Okay, as a conclusion, I think Pio really supports our creative process. The time between uh, an artistic idea and the moment when we can test it is much shorter than with other solutions. So we, can, we have an idea, we can test it very quickly, and most of the time we say, well, um, that was a bad idea. Uh, but as it goes fast, we can try many things, and sometimes we, we think, well, this is a good idea, we keep it. Uh, and uh, Pio is really very helpful in this case. We have, we have all the flexibility of Python with C efficiency. Uh, for instance, the, the idea of a state machine, I had it already when I was programming in Chuck, and, well, I wouldn't say that what was completely impossible to, to program, but I'm quite sure it wouldn't have been so so nice and tidy as with Python. It's also an example of Python uh, used in a very unexpected situation. Low latency audio treatment is not exactly the, the place where you would expect Py, uh, Python to, to come. And a great, great thing is that, that Pi was very actively developed. It happened to me twice that I asked on the mailing list, well, I want to do this, but I don't know how to, to do it with Payo. And Olivier Benanger uh, answered, well, I'm sorry, it's not possible yet, but uh, I'll keep you informed. And less than 24 hours later, I would get a second message, well, it's implemented in Git, just clone the repository. So it's really great to, to um, work like this. And uh, I would like to, to thank Olivier for, for this great work. Now, if you, if you have questions, I will gladly answer them if I can. And uh, if you want to follow uh, what we do, uh, here are a few, a few pointers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mathieu. That was absolutely fascinating. <laughs> do we have questions? Yeah, thank you, that was great. Um, just one quick question, you mentioned at the beginning that uh, there were actually a couple of applications that you couldn't, uh, or that you tried to explore and they weren't there. And my experience is exactly the opposite, like normally if you play with reverbs, delays, sequences, you have like thousands of parameters and there are a thousand versions and you can tweak every single bit. So 
can you give us a couple of examples what you actually couldn't do or is it more that you appreciate the simplicity or the straightforwardness of a python approach well partly is it's that of course uh, I, I like the um, uh, the compact version of uh, uh, I, I think it's for me easier to uh, to have all my code uh, in one screen with uh, numbers there than having you know sliders and and different controls uh, everywhere on the screen but that's my my way of thinking uh, but anyway uh, the things i can't do are not having uh, this particular kind of reverb or thing like that uh, there are more things about the um, the architecture of the piece uh, for instance um, I, uh, in, in the last piece you, you heard, snaking around, uh, I have a certain number of bars uh, in D minor, you all heard that it was D minor, uh, and then I, um, I have a pitch shifting from D minor to uh, EB uh, for a certain number of bars, and then I come back to D minor, and then I have a break, and then I come again on the, on the bar. And this is not absolutely impossible to do uh, with uh, software like Superlooper, but uh, I would have to use my foot a lot to tell, well, now I want to, uh, to uh, make the um, uh, pitch shifting, and now I want to have the break, and now I want to come here, uh, and probably I, uh, I would have to, to have two or three foot controllers, and I would uh, constantly be, uh, <laughs> you know, like uh, uh, thinking, uh, it's also that uh, if things are more automatic, I can more uh, in the gig concentrate on what I'm playing. So the thing I can't do with the software are rather those uh, thing about architecture of the of the song. There was another another question, question over there. Yeah. I was wondering, did you use your laptop for this, or did you use a single board computer like a Raspberry Pi to do this? And if not, could you use a Raspberry Pi or another similar ARM device to do this? Well, I would like to. Uh, for now, I'm using my laptop because uh, usually. <laughs> Um, the, ideally, I would like to have a headless Raspberry Pi or something like that, uh, and so I don't need to look at the screen, uh, and uh, I can do everything from my foot controller. Uh, for now, I don't have the tools to do this, uh, so I need a screen, and so it's much easier to have a laptop. Uh, now, about the Raspberry Pi, last time I looked, it was not that easy to... Um, to have low latency audio uh, through USB for some driver problems. I don't know if they are solved or not. But basically, if you use Linux, it's completely different with other operating systems, but if you use Linux, you don't need much uh, power to much CPU power to, um, to have low latency audio. And so, in theory, you shouldn't be able to, you should be able to, to do this with a well, a s small computer like Raspberry Pi. But for practical reasons, for now, I do it with a laptop. All right, we're running out of time. May I ask the next speaker to come in front? Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot.